Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part three of my series on the selected gross pathology of the horse in which we're going to talk about the endocrine system. As I do with all of my lectures, I want to start out by thanking all of my great friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me these fantastic images, which allow me to put these lectures together. Now, when we talk about endocrine pathology in the horse, there's not a lot of different entities. The most important is the one that we're looking at here, which we all learned about in veterinary school, and that is the pituitary tumor arising in the pars intermedia. Um, these particular tumors will cause changes on their own and then additional changes um, in clinical symptomatology as a result of growth and because the Celotersica is not complete in the horse as it is in the dogs. As these tumors grow, they press upward on the hypothalamus of the brain. So we see some additional symptoms just because of tumor growth. Remember, the hypothalamus regulates body temperature, appetite, and the cyclic shedding of hair. So these animals generally have long, curly, matted hair and have to be clipped on a regular basis because they don't shed it. Um, they also will uh, have hyperhidrosis or sweating due to their inability to regulate their body temperature. And they may have changes in their appetite uh, with polyphagia as a presenting sign. They do have a number of other symptoms which we'll look at in just a minute because of the various compounds that are secreted by this overactive tumor in the pars intermedia. These animals also may show muscle weakness. They may be obese because of the polyphagia. They may show intermittent pyrexia as well. This is a tumor that is most commonly seen in ponies, often is uh, concurrent with another syndrome which may contribute to similar clinical signs called the metabolic syndrome, which leads to peripheral insulin resistance. Both of these conditions um, can lead to hyperglycemia and glucosuria. It's a disease that's usually seen in older horses and is fairly common. There was a great paper written uh, just a couple years ago by Dr. Peg Miller looking at uh, old age lesions in horses. And this is one that topped the list. Now, one of the most confusing things about these tumors is the constellation of compounds that they produce and the various symptoms that those compounds cause. Okay, corticotrophs in the pars intermedia produce a compound called proopiolipomelanocortin, or POMC. And this is a high molecular weight glycoprotein precursor, which is quickly cleaved to form a high molecular weight form of ACTH, which ultimately is going to lead to the cushionoid signs that these animals show, including elevations in blood glucose. And then the other thing that POMC is cleaved into is beta lipoprotein. Luckily, the processing of this POMC is not very efficient, so the ACTH elevations are only mild. Okay, the beta lipoprotein is further processed to beta endorphins, which give these animals sort of a I'm feeling great somnolent look. You know, they have a constant endorphin rush that makes them sort of mellow. Now, this high molecular weight, ACTH, um, is luckily not a potent stimulation of hypercortisolism. Um, it also breaks down into alpha uh, MSH and CLIP, which is short for corticotropin-like intermediate peptide. The importance of the uh, MSH is that it potentiates the steroidogenic properties of ACTH. So left on its own, ACTH isn't going to do that much. But when you have the production of the melanocyte-stimulating hormone, it sort of potentiates 
the hypercortisol. So that's a whole lot of various hormones that are produced by these tumors and how they lead to disease in these animals. So the tumor produces hormones that lead to a Cushing's like syndrome. The growth of the tumor pushes upward on the hypothalamus to lead to additional syndromes. And if it gets really, really bad, you can have it push upwards on the optic nerves, resulting in cortical, a form of cortical blindness. Having dealt with a pony with one of these tumors for the last decade, um, they actually do pretty well. There is uh, a drug called pergolide. It's a pill that he's given every day, and it seems to have managed at least the growth of the tumor. We still have to deal with the hyperglycemia, with the hirsutism, with the clinical signs, and of course, a lot of these animals. And the, uh, uh, the connection has never been truly established, but one of the common sequela to uh, these tumors and the metabolic syndrome, which accompanies it, um, is founder and laminitis, and he's a old, rickety, 26-year-old laminitic pony. Okay, thyroid tumors, very common in old horses too. Now, if you look at all the old textbooks, they're all going to say that these are follicular adenomas, and these were this information was largely. Uh, written into gospel before the advent of immunohistochemistry. Um, horses, these are not functional. Horses don't get hyperthyroidism. They do get goiter, um, especially foals will get goiter, but, but horses don't get hyperthyroid, so they're not functional. And our experience at the JPC and the experience of a lot of other pathologists is that um, in contrast to what you see in a lot of the textbooks, um, these tend to be C-cell tumors. Once again, they will get really large tumors, but they're never functional. Horses with these tumors are generally euthyroid and asymptomatic, and they're often incidental findings in necropsy of old horses. Adrenal glands. Um, these yellow nodules on the outside of the capsule or may be covered by a thin layer of capsule um, are foci of nodular adrenocortical hyperplasia. This is common in horses as it is common in dogs. Um, usually if you look at them they, the cells within resemble the zona glomerulosa but occasionally you'll see some that look like the zona fasciculata and you can see that uh, um, they have a orange yellow color. Remember when we talk about the uh, the endocrine system, any tissue that produces steroids is going to be sort of yellowish because remember one of the main components that's used in steroidogenesis is fat and when you oxidize fat you start to manufacture things with fat. Fat assumes a yellowish color as it's broken down. So it gives any tissue, um, whether it's the cells of the adrenal cortex or the steroid producing cells of the gonad, a yellowish appearance. Um, these nodules seem to um, not be affected by processes that decrease lipid content in the rest of the cortex. So they often have large lipid vacuoles in them. It's an incidental finding doesn't mean anything in the horse, nor will it mean anything in the dog. As opposed to most species, um, adrenal tumors are not common in horses, and most of the ones that are documented are actually tumors of the adrenal medulla. These will be occasionally uh, endocrinologically active, um, and the animals will exhibit signs of tachycardia and cardiac hypertrophy due to excessive secretion of catecholamines. Um, if you still have a old bottle of Zenker's solution or potassium dichromate, which you probably don't because 
it is carcinogenic and the old formulation used to also include mercury but the textbooks will say that you can uh, turn these tissues a dark brown by applying Zenker's solution to them. Uh, like pheochromocytomas in other species, these tend to be clear rather than yellow-orange, um, which we would expect with a cortical tumor or nodule, and they often have a fair amount of hemorrhage within them. So these are pheochromocytomas. Um, they can be seen as part of multiple endocrine neoplasia in horses, which is even more rare than any single form of endocrine neoplasia. Now, a classic lesion of the adrenal gland, which is non-neoplastic, is this hemorrhage, which is seen in animals with endotoxemia. In humans, it is called the Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. So in animals, we call it the Waterhouse Friedrichsen-like syndrome. It's a sign of endotoxin. And one of the things that I always teach the, the new residents is that endotoxin wax endothelium. Okay, much of the manifestation that we see with endotoxemia is due to its effects on the endothelium, exposure of underlying collagen, and thrombosis and necrosis. And that's what happens here. The uh, endothelium is damaged, you have cortical hemorrhage, and large areas of necrosis of the adrenal cortex. You can see this in animals with severe GI disease. You can see this in foals with actinobacillus E. coli infection, another gram-negative. Um, you can occasionally see adrenal hemorrhage from other causes in horses, including severe stress, uh, such as an animal dying from overexertion, or birth trauma in neonates. So it's not always a Waterhouse Friedrichsen, but that's usually um, the most common cause and a striking lesion in the horse. And our last entity um, is also from the adrenal glands. And you remember that horses, like every other species, as a general rule, the cortex, the medulla, and the cortex on the other side should be one to one to one. Um, and here we can see that there is a marked decrease in the size of the cortex. And this is adrenal cortical atrophy due to the over administration of steroids. Why anyone would give a horse steroids um, is sort of beyond me because they're highly associated with laminitis and we've seen the problems that um, arise in, in animals with iatrogenic Cushing's, but um, this is what you get. You get marked decrease uh, in the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis, remember they don't affect the glomerulosa as much, and, uh, and perhaps this is an animal that had a long time untreated uh, ACTH secreting pars intermediate adenoma. Um, you can also in horses see a transient adrenal insufficiency associated with severe disease uh, usually it's an impaired response to cortisol, not a decreased production of cortisol. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Our next lecture, or maybe two lectures, is going to cover the gastrointestinal system of the horse. So I hope you come back from for that one to wherever you're viewing these lectures, whether they're on the JPC video library or on the foundation's Facebook page or YouTube channel. As always, I wish you a fantastic day and wonderful health. Take care.